This episode with Liesl identifies even more than her people pleasing, which definitely hurts her in her relationship with Rob. You can hear statements she has made and questions she has asked Rob that indicate her people pleasing, as well as her continuing to go to him and to see him only once every two weeks, despite not getting the connection by texting or calls in between. But what she gets to later in the episode is equally, if not more important for her in the long run, which is. I'm so thankful for your advice. I love how intelligent and eloquent you are and still have love. You've given me some great guidance and direction and now it's up to me to execute it. I feel a lot better just working through it. I thank you so, so much. I feel like you already are instilling more confidence in me that this is possible. Sick of sacrificing or settling in your romantic life? Welcome to Make Him Wonder with Coach Paula Grooms where women struggling in real relationships ask the expert. Unscripted, unfiltered, understandable coaching conversations to help passionate women succeed in love. Hi there, and welcome to Make Him Wonder. I'm your host, Coach Paula, a dating and relationship coach, licensed social worker, and author of the book, Why Won't He Commit? How a Man Decides to Make You the One. My guest today is 44-year-old divorced single mom, Liesl, who has been dating 45-year-old Rob for about three months. Liesl states that Rob is emotionally unavailable and that when asked about where they stand, he says that he doesn't like to, quote-unquote, put labels on things. Rob tells Liesl that he was hurt in his marriage, and because of that, he wants to take things slowly. Most concerning to Liesl is that Rob says he likes, quote, aggressive women. Liesl follows the rules and doesn't know what she can do about that desire of Rob's and how she can balance it with making him wonder. Liesl has been doing sleep meditations for about six months now and wants my help in determining if they are working and if she should continue to put her time and attention into this relationship with Rob or move on. So Liesl, want to hear about this aggressive women desire of Rob's, how you met, and the trajectory of this relationship so far in the past three months. So tell us, how did you meet? Hi, Paula. So we met on your favorite app, Bumble. (laughs) I liked him and I know, I now know why you don't like the app, (laughs) but I reached out to him, just said hi, and he did, he responded back and then we chatted And then we set up a call, a FaceTime call, which I thought went really well. And then about a week and a half went by because he had to travel out of town, kept in touch every few days. And then finally he asked me out on a first date and we met on a first, on the date, um, which went really well. And then, yeah, we've been dating for about, now we're going into month four. Yeah, it's been about, I would say, 10 dates that we've been on since. And when you say dating, tell us more about that. Is there sex involved? No sex? You just go on these dates once a week with nothing in between or you talk in between? What's your relationship like? So he is also a single dad. He has a 13-year-old son um, that he has every other week. And he told me up front that he, when his son was with him, that he did not date. So I was okay with that because I have children as well and I understand. So we basically see each other twice a month. A few times we've seen each other twice a week. He does live 45 minutes away from me. Which recently he brought to light that he found that could be a problem long term. And yeah, our Our relationship has, I know we had a few missteps. I am still learning the rules. So uh, we were intimate about date, it was date two, which I know is early. And that was a moment of weakness for me. I do feel that after that, things did have stayed the same. And it's funny, I actually did ask him before the date, um, because his background actually is in psychology. And I asked him if he Uh, knew about the Freud uh, Madonna horror complex and he did and he said that he did not apply that 
to himself, that he did not put women, regardless of when they had sex, in either category, which I found interesting um, because I told him that was a concern that if we did have sex this early on that he would do that. And he said, no, I've had sex with women early, very even on the first date. And that turned into be a great relationship. And then he said he's had, he's waited like months to have it. And that, that relationship didn't necessarily go well. So I didn't know how to take that. In a way, maybe I took it as, okay, this is permission to go ahead and be intimate without his judgment. But I don't know if that really hurt me or not. Okay, thank you for that. It brings up a very interesting, almost conundrum for women. Unfortunately, because we're women, we are in a position that can be looked at as unfair because things, while equal between the sexes, are so very different for the sexes, they aren't at all the same. And you made a classic mistake of talking to him about this concept, believing that he, as a heterosexual man, can be different than other men, maybe because he's a psychologist, and that by asking him about the Madonna whore complex and if he knew about it, he can give you an answer and it would be truly the answer for him and psychologically the answer. It's very difficult to explain this, but I will attempt. In other words, he knows about it, but of course he is going to perceive himself as it not having anything to do with who he chooses to be with. And the reason why he can say that with a great degree of honesty is because it's true. It will not mean anything about who he wants to be with sexually and somewhat otherwise, but it will absolutely have an effect on him seeing you as marriage material. He told you everything really you need to know in that he's dated women and it's had no effect on him. He perceives that as true because there's a great degree that it is true. But there is no male who doesn't have it in his reptilian brain, meaning the Madonna whore dichotomy. And we know that there is no such thing. We're all on a scale of being sexual or not sexual according to whether we like that man enough or not. You asking him, of course he's not going to tell you that he would judge you on that. It's the second date and he has a chance of having sex with you. He's male. Does what I'm saying compute? Yes, it does. Okay. So just so listeners can know, we don't ever ask whether they know it or not. That's like saying to a woman, are you aware that you bond through time and sex? And it would be like a male sitting in front of you and saying, I know that if I have sex with you, woman, you're going to bond with me even if I'm not right for you. And even if I show you that I'm not the greatest guy and I don't necessarily give you all that you want, you're going to be bonded to me. Yes, many women would say, you're right, but... And then they would go into the reasons right then and there as to why they can override it given the circumstances right then and there, the circumstances of the moment. But all things being equal, most women, no matter the man, if they like him enough, spend enough time, have sex with him, she will bond. It's a given. We cannot escape our biological leanings. So it is why we do not discuss these things with the man because in that moment, he is going to be self-serving and consider himself above the gender-specific biological leanings that he has. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, it does. And okay. yes, so I made two missteps. <laughs> it's okay because while yes, on the second date, it's a bit soon because he hasn't had the chance to pursue. And when the man doesn't have a chance to pursue, we thwart his falling for us because men fall through pursuit, 
through the act of pursuing, they fall. This is why you understand now why I don't recommend Bumble. It's not really just the pursuit. It's that right away when a woman shows, especially online, I'm interested in you, it can take down the man's interest. And I say this with great reservation because... In person, if you were to meet him out at, say, you know, you're at a restaurant bar with friends and you meet him and you show by looking at him, smiling and giving off the indicators that you find him attractive. He still has to do a great deal of thinking about it. And in that moment, he's going to be more motivated in a sense. And even if you go up to him then and there and make the first move, which I'm not necessarily, I'm not recommending, but even if you do, if you do things to lead him down the road of pursuit, just by virtue, because we are human animals, that in-person interaction has much more impact. Maybe it's pheromones, whatever it is, but it just has much more impact than online. Online makes it too, too easy for the man. So yes, I'm not the biggest fan of Bumble. But again, if you lead him to pursuit, it can be okay. And it started on Bumble with you reaching out. Okay, you might think that that's a misstep. No, not necessarily. And again, it's not the individual missteps. It's that we pile them on each other. And unfortunately, the second misstep of sex on the second date kind of pile those two things on. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Okay. So he's now saying two things I'm hearing that you are concerned about. One is the 45 minute drive. And the second is that he likes aggressive women. So tell us about that. Yes. He made it known up front. Um, and it makes sense why he's on Bumble. <laughs> he, he likes women who instigate or kind of go after the man and this was confirmed um and we went to a movie recently and in the movie it was set in the 20s and the women in the movie were very aggressive and each time a woman made a move on a guy or went up to a man he leaned next to me over to me and said i like that i like that so he constantly i feel is telling me he likes when the woman goes makes moves and he's always said he likes 50 50 relationship he likes it when the woman will offer to pay on the date so it's something that i've never experienced before but with him so i i don't know exactly how to take it other than just you're following your rules which i have been trying to do since since we've been intimate i'm hearing that those two things are likely causing you to feel a lot of dissonance. Yes, because of this, I, I've been getting a lot of anxiety throughout our relationship. And I don't know if it's because, again, that we only see each other twice a month, but also when we don't see each other, he's not a great communicator and he doesn't text um, as often as I would like. So I've been trying to learn if that's just who he is as a, as a communicator. Um, I also, when he does text, it's very, also very vague and very dry texting in a way. He hardly asks questions to get, you know, or anything, which I understand texting is not for that. But when we're, we don't only see each other twice a month, I'm not feeling connected. And I, and I did bring this up to him and he did get a little defensive when I did bring that up. When I did bring up that I felt like I needed more communication from him. I even suggested a phone call because he never called and I offered to call him and he shot that down once by saying, I will be busy in a meeting. And I said, I understand. I, I said, I, I would love to hear your voice since we don't see each other. And, but he never called later that day and ever since. So our basic form of communication is texting, but the texting is very dry and um, unemotional, which I, again, I understand, but I guess it leaves me feeling anxious because I'm not feeling connected. But he has been consistent in asking me out. Like I said, we've been out on 10 dates now. And I'm going to surmise, I want you to correct me on this if I'm wrong, that the dates once every couple of weeks are set 
He comes to you, he takes you out, you have sex, he leaves. So I mostly go to him. He has come to me twice, but again, my situation right now is temporary, but I'm, I currently live with my brother since being divorced, and I'm, I currently work at a at my daughter's school, um, and I'm, I'm very embarrassed of it, but um, I, I'm a lunch lady <laughs> so that my daughters can stay in their schools because I wanted to keep consistency for them um, when we got divorced because um, their dad moved an hour away. So I wanted to keep that, and once they finish this year, I, I will be switching jobs and, and pursuing a new career. So, uh, again, my situation is not ideal, very situ- situational and and he knew that so he did ask and say should would you like me to come to you he did twice but i feel like coming here is a is not ideal and so i would offer to meet him halfway or we or go to him which i know is not part of the rules so another misstep on my part <laughs> but we don't want to go backwards okay we want to go forwards Yes, definitely, definitely forward. I'm learning a lot. <laughs> and through your pod, through, I'm in your 80-20 wonder club. And I seriously have been richly educated. Like I, yes, I've learned so much from just from that. Excellent. That's a good thing. So there are a couple things here that I want to define, because I think that'll help you. And before I do that, I want to ask you, how long were you married? I was married for 15 years. And I've been divorced It will be two years in April, officially divorced. And I don't know if this makes a difference or my ex. We had a great, a a good relationship. We were very good friends, but I look back and yes, we were more roommates, but my ex around COVID came out gay to me. So that is why we divorced, but we have remained friends um, throughout it and almost better friends now and and really good co-parents. So I feel like in that sense, Things have been great, but I, yeah, like I said, it's been two years since, and my ex, he did get married this past summer, and so my daughter, this, it's probably irre- irrelevant, but yes, they have another, they, a new dad in their life, so it's been um, interesting because my daughters, they don't ask if, a lot about my dating life, um, but they ask, when are you going to get married, and yes, I don't know how that <laughs> re- is relevant to this story, but it's been a journey, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Yes, I'm very sorry that that happened. It sounds like you're making the best of a very difficult situation when you found out. Yes, yes. Okay, and why is Rob divorced? He actually told me on the first date um, he divorced. He said it wasn't for any cheating or any, you know, they they didn't fight. He said they just grew apart, Um, and he said his ex-wife grew into a different person than who he married, and that's kind of all he gave me, but he said he was hurt by it. He said he was, you know, in it for the long haul. How long was he married? He was married for 10 years, and he's been divorced for four and a half years. Okay. And the dating since the divorce? He said he has been dating a lot. He's had three relationships, and I didn't ask details about those. He just said that he's just been yeah, dating a lot, but he doesn't exactly, I mean, he, he knew on my profile that I stated I want wanted a relationship. And on the first date, I did, he did ask me again. And I said, I was looking for a relationship that eventually turned into uh, an, a commitment like marriage. Like I would like to get married again one day. And I asked him what he was looking for. And he just said a relationship. So I'm not sure if he is open to getting remarried again, and I haven't really asked him again. Okay. I have quite a few concerns about this relationship, and it's likely why you're here, because you likely do too. Okay. (laughs) Is that right? Yes, yes. And I want to hear about your concerns before I give you mine. Yes. My concerns are that he, first of all, he likes aggressive women and I'm not an aggressive woman I I I told him up front that I was more traditional dater I like the man to court the woman and my other concern is he's emotionally unavailable I felt feel like I have been asking him more and knowing and learning more about him than he has me um, I don't feel there's you know he's reciprocating in that sense I feel like when we are together it is is one like it's wonderful. Like we have a lot of fun together. We connect. The chemistry is definitely there. 
I, it's wonderful when we're together, but when we're apart, that's when my anxiety shows up. And I don't want this to become a situationship. And I have expressed that to him. And he didn't really reassure me that when I did express that, he just said he really liked spending time with me and was excited to see where this goes. So that's kind of where we're at. But those are my main concerns with him. The distance thing doesn't bother me as much because like I said, my situation is temporary. I do have goals and plans to move out on my own um, when I switch careers. And I'm open to moving closer to not necessarily for him or near him, but just closer in an area um, that makes sense. So I, I guess that's kind of where I'm at. And then I also, again, seeing him only twice a month, makes me, I mean, I understand he's a single dad, and his, but his son is 13. So I guess I feel like, is this him showing that he's not that into me, that he's not making me a priority? I, I, yeah, I, I'm left feeling, like I said, anxious. And my answer is not going to lessen your anxiety, but your commitment to doing what will have any chance of moving this to where you want it will likely do that. Okay. Because the answer is that this is not the same relationship for him as it is for you at all. What do you mean by that? For him, it's an absolute situationship. For you, you want more. I do. Why do you think I would say it's a situationship for him? I think even though he said differently, he did put me in the first category because we were intimate early on. Um... And it seems that it's like not every time that we're together are we intimate, but a, a lot of the times it's happened. And he probably looks at me as, yeah, this is my, she will come to me and give me sex when I take her out. <laughs> yes, the latter is true. When you say, because I slept with him on the second date, I'm in second category, which is girl just to have fun with. It's not really that. It's more all of it and that you've continued down the road of just for fun and how you've continued down the road of just for fun is that you have accepted the twice a month and you go to him you go out you have sex he doesn't show you anything in between that he wants more quite to the contrary he shows you he wants nothing more no matter what he says you've had discussions a man saying, I just want to see where it goes, is simply to placate you because it doesn't mean he's a bad guy. He's not trying to lie to you. He's not thinking ahead. And it's a quid pro quo that you have shown you're okay with. And when you're together, you have a wonderful time. He truly enjoys your company and who you are. There are red flags here that I want you to be thinking about. And I want to talk to you about where you go from here and how you might attempt to salvage this so that you don't take your self-concept into the tank and you come out of this feeling really good about yourself and stronger. And I want to get to that in a moment. I trust you're enjoying Make Him Wonder and that you're getting a lot of helpful information for the life of love you desire and deserve. So if you're not part of the 80-20 Wonder Club yet, you need to be, because now Make Him Wonder is exclusive, a members-only club to listen to every episode, past, present, and future, in full, all ad-free. The 80-20 Wonder Club is a Make Him Wonder membership that gives you all of seasons one, two, and three in a categorized list by age and relationship status and a multimedia library of my content, including my book, relationship evals, and my Mechanics of Men Mindset Manual, a weekly action step you can focus on to attract and keep the man of your dreams and have him committing to you completely in the coming months. Make this the moment you start living as an 80-20 Wonder Woman, because love, like life, is best lived in 80-20. When you do 80% of what works with men, the 20% you don't won't much matter. Join the 80-20 Wonder Club by going to the 8020wonder.club. Don't miss out. Go now to the 8020wonder.club. You and your man will be glad you did. 
So we're back with 44-year-old divorced single mom, Liesl, who's been dating Rob for about three months. And we're going to dive into what I feel are the red flags here. Before I do that, Liesl, what do you make of my saying that he sees this as a situationship and that I even use the words red flags? I mean, it makes sense now when I look at it, because I... I did ask at one point, told him I didn't want this to turn into a situationship, what he, where he thought that this would go. And that's also when he said, I don't like to put labels on things. I don't have a timeline and I like to take things slow. And then he said, I'm, I'm, but I'm excited to see where this goes. So that's confusing to me because I thought surely by three months, a guy should know, I guess, something. <laughs> but yeah, I, I do think that You're right, there are a lot of red flags, which makes me sad. (laughs) Yes, but there is a ray of hope here. If he's at all honest, which there's no reason not to believe that he isn't, I'm not suggesting that he isn't. And the ray of hope is that he said, I'm excited to see where this goes. If those were his exact words, excited to see where this goes, that's a good sign. If he said, I just want to see where things go, that's different. Yes, he, he did say he was excited. And I said I was excited too. Okay. So there's that ray of hope, but you're going to have to do things differently to have any chance of him not losing that excitement. But right now, let's look at it simply from the tangible things that he can see and understand of your behavior. What do you think he thinks about this relationship? Not from what you've said, from what you are doing. What do you think? Um, I think he's probably thinking this is great. I can um, play with my puppy and not have to do much to get what I want. He probably doesn't see me as a worthy opponent. I agree. You sound very, very sweet lovely. If your friends had to give four adjectives about you, what do you think those adjectives would be? Definitely, yes, definitely kind, happy. And I, I mean, in the past, I've been known to be a people pleaser. But yes, I, I would say they would say I'm mostly a, a joyful person. Okay, so three of those are really good. One of those is going to hurt you. Which one do you think that is? <laughs> The people pleaser, for sure. Or it has hurt me. Yes, yes. And that I assume you're aware of, and that might be what you are doing the sleep meditations around. Is that a fair statement? Yes, yes, 100%. I I know that's definitely why. (laughs) Great. This is a really good place to start. If we unpack the phrase people pleaser, what would you say is the person who is a people pleaser, why would it be that they are? What do they get from it? And what do they want from it? I know people pleasers are, I guess, didn't get something in their early childhood from our primary caretakers. And that's why we look to please people because it makes us feel, I guess, valuable or that we're doing something right. Yes, it is that... When you were very, very young, before the age of reason, to get your needs met in any way, shape, or form, you had to become what you felt someone else wanted and do what you thought would please them so that you, bottom line, actually survived. It's that profound. So you've been programmed to please others to get your needs met. And when we're programmed with that, what we believe in our deepest subconscious is that we are not worthy, valuable, or lovable just because we exist. In other words, if we're not pleasing others, we don't have intrinsic value. Now that may seem consciously to be almost ridiculous. Like, of course I know I have value. And consciously you do. Of course you do. But subconsciously, you're still believing that you really don't. So I'm so glad to hear you are doing sleep meditations for this. I hope you are doing them in the I am form. 
and about your worth and your value. Are you? Yes, yes, I have been. Fantastic. And I assume you got that from the 8021er Club and the people that I recommend, Jessica Heslop, Jason Stevenson, I think it's The Rising of the Phoenix. There are many. Yes, I listen to all those. Wonderful. Do you feel it has had some effect? Because you did say in the introduction that they crafted for me that you want my help in determining if they are working. What do you mean by that? I mean, since I've been doing them for about six months now, but I guess in this situation with our dating Rob, it has brought the anxiety and um, some feelings of unworthiness still that I have been feeling. And so I'm just wondering at what point do you know that you know they're working and then how long should you do them to help obviously I have a lot of work to do but at, is this something I need to do my the rest of my life so it's a good question our subconscious is programmed by our primary caregivers and the programming has to do with worth value and lovability and it is why it is almost solely transferred in adulthood to love interests. In other words, we can have incredibly high value in other areas of life, but in this area of life, we will struggle in a way that we don't with other things. And because it goes to our deepest core of lovability, and that is transferred to an adult love interest in a way no other love, meaning any kind of familial love, friendship love, worthiness about our capabilities with jobs, careers, what have you. It just doesn't transfer in the same way. So when you ask, do I need to do this my whole life? Here's what happens. Our subconscious is a record and memory, if you will, of everything we need to know to survive. And it's also a, a housing or storage place for the programs of all that we do with our bodies. So talking is on a program. Walking is on a program. And then we have many things that we don't have to think about. Uh, our heart rhythm, all manner of things that are regulated there as well. But learned things are definitely programmed in a way that we can't unprogram them. For example, if I said to you, well, we have got to override your program of language. You wouldn't do that in six months, would you? No. Override your program of walking. You wouldn't do that in six months, would you? No, not at all. You wouldn't ever do it because it is so programmed, you can't unprogram it without actually going into your brain and possibly brain damage, right? Right. Yeah. So we can think of it kind of like that. It's less though. Thank goodness. But for example, anything that has to do with survival is highly programmed. So I think about this because I saw a, a reel about this and it was a little boy's first birthday and he's sitting in the high chair and there's one candle on the cake and it's lit and everybody's singing and we look at him and he's so happy and then we think, okay, he's going to blow the candle out. Instead, he grabs the flame and he immediately starts bawling, immediately programmed for him that he will never not have is fire does that to you. That's a good thing. We all have it. Every single one of us has it. We learned it somewhere along the line. Maybe not to that degree, but we know it. But there are people, it's less that we see nowadays, but for example, in circuses, there were what is known as fire breathers and they would take flaming like sticks. They have big balls of fire on the end of them and they would swallow them and put the flames out. You've seen those? Yes. Those are crazy. <laughs> right? Now you would say, well, they don't have the program. No, they do. There's not a human alive that doesn't have the programmed fear of fire. They override the program every time they do it. It's conscious, it's learned behavior to override it. And we need to do the same thing. And it's much easier in a way to deal with overriding something emotional rather than physical. 
So that's a good thing. But make no mistake, the overriding needs to be continued. It is like anything else learned. So if you, in your youth, say, you're a gymnast, pretty programmed in you how to do all those maneuvers. But if you didn't do it for 20 years and you're now 35, well, yes, it's there. It's not there like it was when you were 13 on the balance beam, correct? Correct. Same thing. Same thing. Riding a bike. Yes. Riding a bike is a program and you may not have done it since you were a kid. When you go out to the bike, you're now 40 years old and you haven't done it since you were 16, 15. You step on the pedal, you're really wobbly at first and it feels really strange, but somehow you just, it's not like when you first started. Remember your training wheels and then taking them off and the difficulty? It's not like that. Same thing, to continue to override it for the self-concept you know you deserve and is in your conscious mind. You know that you are everything Rob could want and desire consciously, correct? Yes. I hear a little hesitancy. What's that about? <laughs> I'm, I mean, I, I do believe that. I just don't know if he feels that way. Um, at one point I asked him if he thought he was uh, too busy for a relationship and, and he responded with um, kind of like, oh, well, that's relative. Um, and then he said, well, maybe I'm just not the right match for you if, if you're already asking this. I feel like I am worthy of him, but I don't, but him saying that make, makes me feel, the, again, the, the, I guess the doubt comes up. Like maybe you're not a right match for me because you're asking this. Okay. So right then and there with your answer, it shows me that your self-concept is not where it needs to be. The answer is solely, oh yeah, I'm all that in a bag of chips for him. But you are going on what he thinks. That will never allow him to see you in the light he needs to see you. You see? Mm. It doesn't matter what he thinks. Because if you think of yourself as, it, as that there is no one that can hold a candle to you for him, th then he will actually feel like that. That's how it works energetically. But because of your programming, you are going by what he shows to you. It's a vicious cycle that if you don't see yourself as all that in a bag of chips, he can't and then he can't. So he projects onto you and then you feel less of one and it just circles and circles and circles. Yeah. How do you get out of the circle? <laughs> mm -hmm. It takes some doing, but it's a must to do. And that's the work that I do with women in my programs because without it, it will continue as it is. Now, you're certainly doing some things to help it, but sleep meditations are not enough. It's what you do with him behaviorally so that you can start to see some little bit of evidence and then working on your self-concept with additional stuff manifesting as well a little bit helps so that needs to be done then we want to look at which we started this with when we came back from the break the red flags and there certainly are several the first is quick one you might be surprised to know that there are over 150 real life love and relationship coaching conversations just like this one ready for you to hear right now and you can have access to all of those by looking at my pinned comment below yes the 80 20 wonder club is yours for a full month for free by looking at that comment and taking advantage of this wonderful offer for you to level up whether you're in your 20s 30s, 40s, 50s, you're in a divorce situation, you have a situation ship, or you want an ex back. There are 150 plus episodes there and more to come categorized by age and relationship status, all ad free in their entirety so that you can learn, level up, and take a leap forward in your relationship. Take a look at that comment below, follow the one easy step there, and I will see you in the club. Now back to the episode. He's giving you 
absolutely no indication that he wants more. Actually, he's giving you indication that he wants things exactly where they are and no more. And he's even priming the pump a little. Do not get your hopes up here because of the distance, which I'm not happy about. And I like aggressive women. Have you ever asked him to define that? Um, yes. And then he showed it by what we saw in the movie. Um, he said he likes when a girl instigates communication, dates, and paying for the date. He said he liked the 50-50 approach, but he loves it, especially when the woman, I guess, does, makes the moves on the, on the man. Not, yeah, inside and outside of the bedroom, of course. <laughs> okay. What does that tell you? That tells me that maybe he's not in his masculine energy. And he did tell me that he, he grew up with an absent father himself. And maybe that's, that's where I'm gathering why he's emotionally unavailable. Um, he's very close to his mom, but he said he rarely talked. He's always struggled with um, getting attention from his dad. So I wonder if this is translating into his um, subconscious. Okay. And I believe this is all on a scale. And I'll tell you that, or let me use a bit of an maybe analogy or metaphorical statement. If you are not really looking for something, but it comes to you and fills a void, it feels pretty good, correct? Yes. So there's part of that. I want to know what it is about men, and have you thought about this, who want a woman to take the lead. Have you really unpacked for yourself the fact that your first husband liked men and now there's another man in your life who wants a woman to be aggressive aka more in the masculine role i mean i guess i haven't made that connection but now that you mention it i mean it is interesting what was going on when you were very young that could shed some light on what that is and you can think about it in a number of ways, but many times it is more along the lines of someone in the masculine role or with masculine energy in your very young life being someone that you had to kind of fear. That can happen. Yeah, that I can see that. I mean, my dad was ab emotionally absent as well growing up, and yes, he had some anger. So I can see that. I did fear him in a way, but I also tried extra hard to please him. There you go. So it's safer to be with men who don't exhibit those highly masculine traits. You're right. Yeah, it is. It feels emotionally safer. But you certainly have identified that Rob is like your dad in that he is emotionally unavailable. Yes, they share that in common. My question and is, can you guide this relationship with someone who is emotionally unavailable or is it this a lost cause, especially since I seem to attract emotionally unavailable men? Well, you answered as to the why you do. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when you start stepping into your own, for lack of a better word, personal power, and all that means is that you truly know who you are and what you have to offer, this will change. It's interesting that you brought up the rules. I don't know how you came to find that or what that actually means because it means so many different things to different women, but nothing about this has been quote unquote the rules. What do you mean when you say you follow them? Well, obviously I don't follow them. I am aware of them. Friend that I work out with, she actually was telling me about the rules. And that's actually where I initially first heard about you and your podcast. And she knew that I'm newly divorced and I have no dating skills. So she's told me about these rules, like there are dating rules. I guess there's a book called The Rules. Yes. And for you, with your essence of sweetness and what you have identified as people pleasing can be quite helpful. To take this though now and attempt to fit this into the rules 
I think will hurt you. In other words, if you were starting with someone new, yes, you can do the rules and someone with your essence and demeanor, meaning sweet and what you've identified as people pleasing, the rules can be very helpful because they create great boundaries. Okay. I can, I definitely need those. But with this, with Rob, I prefer for you that you didn't read the book and get into it. You're in the 8020 Wonder Club, so you can absolutely get what you need by listening. It sounds like you have learned a lot. You came here to be on today. You can do this kind of step by step and going slowly into creating more boundaries and stopping the one thing that's hurting you more than anything else. And that is wondering what I'm going to tell Liesl I believe to be the one thing that is hurting her more than anything else in her relationship with Rob. In the rest of this episode, I outline the three things Liesl will need to do to allow Rob to see her in a new light and have any chance of a real relationship with this man. And because I want you to get the results you desire, with your current or future Mr. Right, I invite you to check out the 8020 Wonder Club, where you can hear the rest of this episode with Liesl and so much more. The 8020 Wonder Club is an exclusive membership-only club of the Make Him Wonder podcast, where you'll get over 150 ad-free episodes categorized by age and relationship status, plus all new episodes the moment they're formatted and ready to be aired unfiltered coaching conversations like this one with all my advice and principles to have you succeeding in your romantic life. But there is much more. The 8020 Wonder Club includes my Making Magic with Men Mindset Manual, a weekly video series of mindset and mechanics practices for you to do at your own pace. It alone is valued at over $500 and is all yours as a member. Join monthly and cancel at any time or save by committing to a six or 12 month membership. And not only will you save by committing to more, you'll receive a full coaching intensive experience where you'll be talking to me in a conversation like you just heard. You choose the date anytime during your 12 months and I'll be answering all your questions on getting what you desire and deserve in your romantic life. Check it out at the 8020wonder.club and join us as that is the only way you'll be able to hear the rest of what I tell Liesl she must do to have the best chance of Rob investing his time and giving her the attention she deserves in a real relationship. Don't miss out on how to make your man wonder in the right way to have divine right results in your relationship or how to start dating in a way that guides a potential Mr. Right to do right by you. Go now to the 8020wonder.club. That's the 8020wonder.club. Wonder.club. You and your love will be glad you did.